Christiana Figueres is an internationally recognized leader on climate change. She was Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change from 2010 to 2016. She successfully directed the international negotiations from 2010, culminating in the historic Paris Agreement of 2015, signed unanimously by 195 countries. Christiana is a founding partner of Global Optimism, a purpose-driven enterprise focused on social and environmental change and host of the podcast, Outrage and Optimism. Tom Rivet Karnak is a leader in the fields of international diplomacy, energy policy, and climate change. From 2013 to 2016, Tom was senior strategy advisor to the executive secretary of the UN Convention on Climate Change, a position he held up to and during the successful negotiations in Lima and Paris, which resulted in the unanimous signing of the Paris Agreement. Together with Christiana, he is a founding partner at Global Optimism, a purpose-driven enterprise focused on social and environmental change and co-host of the podcast. Brady Pinheiro Walkinshaw is the CEO of GRIST, a leading national environmental media nonprofit dedicated to climate, justice, and solutions. GRIST reaches an audience of millions with Vital Journalism and its Solutions Lab Project Fix, which lifts up the leaders and their ideas to solve the climate crisis. Before joining GRIST in 2017, Brady represented Central Seattle in the Washington State Legislature and spent several years at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Christiana and Tom have a new book titled, The Future We Choose, The Stubborn Optimist Guide to the Climate Crisis, and it is the subject of today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Brady Walkinshaw, Christiana Figueres, and Tom Rivet Karnak. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, we're really all excited to be here and excited to go into discussion here today with Christiana Figueres and, and Tom Rivet Karnak. Again, I'm Brady Walkinshaw. I lead the environmental media organization, Gris.org, and I am zooming in on this beautiful Seattle day uh, from our offices around the top floor of the Bullet Center on Capitol Hill. Um, so I'm really pleased to be with you all and even more delighted to be with these two uh, prestigious guests who have done an extraordinary amount uh, to advance humanity's progress in solving what we will talk about today, which I believe is indeed the greatest uh, existential challenge that we face. Uh, and these two leaders will bring to it a dose of optimism. Uh, and we're gonna explore exactly what that means when, when we talk about optimism. So I just wanted to start out and give both of these uh, guests a chance to introduce themselves. And perhaps as they do, maybe share one or two experiences in their own lives that, that really um, are the reason that centers their work day in and day out in, in tackling the climate crisis. So, Perhaps we could start with you, uh, Cristiana Figueres. Uh, well, thanks very much, Brady. And uh, thank you, Caroline, uh, for, uh, for having us on. Um, personal experiences of why, why I dedicate my life to climate change. Um, I've spoken repeatedly in public about uh, my experience as a very young mother taking my two small children to the national park here in Costa Rica where I live and where I was born uh, to see a particular species of toad that existed when I was very young. And that by the time I had my children had actually disappeared as a species. Uh, and that had a profound impact on me. Um, later on, as I already delved into climate change, I remember coming to the end of my first term as executive secretary of uh, the climate convention and uh, trying to decide, should I accept the second term or not? And as I was trying to decide that, um, I was in Austria and I invited my brother and my sister who had never seen a glacier uh, born and bred as they were in Costa Rica. And they came for a very special occasion and I took them up to see a glacier for the first time in their life. And the only thing that was up there was brown rock. And I remember being so upset, so upset because I had seen that glacier just a few years before. Um, and, and that's when I just decided, okay, that's it. If this can happen that quickly, then 
I'm staying in. Uh, and that made me decide to, uh, to stay one more term in the climate convention and take the process that had already started, but then take it to, uh, to the Paris Agreement in 2015. And many other personal, <laughs> personal encounters with, the, uh, with climate change, but, um, but let me just share those two today. Um, Great, thank you. And, and, and thanks, Brady and, and Seattle Town Hall. Wonderful to be here and to be speaking to everybody. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story, a slightly different story. I mean, like Christiana, that we, so many of us are in this work because of so many experiences of the natural world and of inequality and of other different things that have kind of perpetuated our lives over, over years and have kind of shaped our decisions that have taken us to where we are. But, but one particular um, story that uh, was very defining for me um, I come from a family that has a long history in colonialism, which is not unusual for someone from the UK. And in fact, my direct descendant was the chairman of the East India Company, which was a, an appalling company that basically controlled India and was the only private company in history to have had, a, to have had its own army, right? So it basically suppressed India. Um, and when I was growing up, I was very close to my grandfather and he'd tell me these stories of colonialism combined with the trappings of the oil paintings from the old days and say, you know, this is our history, this is who we are, with these kind of implications of the greatness and how you should be proud of that. And that kind of built up in these stories and, and tragically nothing I learned in school dislodged that, which is its own separate issue. But it wasn't until later and I traveled to India as a young man and I saw a portrait in an old gallery outside Mumbai that was Sir James Rivik Karnak shooting tigers in Orissa. And I started to like pick at the fabric of what this story was and it began to collapse. And of course it was not a story of glory and riches. It was a story of exploitation and extraction and cruelty. And that began me, began my journey really, or was a significant part of my journey of multiple things, including how stories affect our lives and how we understand our past and our future. But it also really made me question, what does it mean to live now as somebody who has benefited from that long history, you know, through no actions of my own, to be in a position of privilege? How do I use that position for collective benefit and for global benefit throughout the course of my life? Which is a question I've tried to continue to ask myself because you can't become a victim because you have this story that is, you know, so challenging. At the same time, you need to utilize that and turn it to some common benefit for the future. So that's just one story from my past. That's wonderful. I, you know, I thought I would just, before we turn to the future and where we need to go to solve the climate crisis, I thought we would just turn a little bit to the past. And, and in the beginning of the book, the two of you talk some about how you both met. Um, and you talk about, you know, just rewinding in history by 11 years, you, you joined um, the United Nations with, Christiana, you as executive secretary of the UN uh, convention, and then Tom later as your senior advisor, um, right on the heels of Copenhagen, and then and then kind of going through, or at the beginning of Copenhagen, and then going through the international negotiation through Paris, which were obviously this, this high moment of, of hope, um, and at least from a US perspective, that, that diminished in the subsequent four years. But um, maybe you could talk a bit about kind of how you both met, and then that road of kind of multilateral progress from Copenhagen to Paris? And, and that's, you know, it's a big question, but just so we, we give a little context to your leadership on an enormous, enormous uh, accomplishment before we dive into the book. Well, I have to say, Brady, Tom's version of how we met is a much funnier version than mine. <laughs> so I defer to him. <laughs> so I'll do that bit and then you can do the, 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 the diplomatic journey from Copenhagen to Paris, all right. Um, so, well, so Christiana had been at the UN, obviously, for three years or more before I got there. And um, m as I understand this story, uh, surrounded, of course, by 500 brilliant individuals who understood the negotiations perfectly, but wanted somebody who could come from outside and sort of think strategically and see a broad picture. And we met, I think the reason Christiana decided she wanted to meet me was because I used to be a Buddhist monk. And so she was intrigued by that combination of experience that I'd done that and I was now running an NGO in New York. And so we met uh, in New York and spent an entire day together talking about 
what was to come, what the challenges were, how far there was left to go to Paris and walked all the way from, from the south of Manhattan up to the, to the Upper West Side. At the end of which she turned to me and said, and this was my first experience of the kind of intuitive power of Christiana Figueres. Uh, she said, it's clear to me you have none of the experience necessary for this job, but I think you'd be brilliant, let's do it. Uh, and so that kind of gave me a sense of like diving in and, and, and then that began our partnership. And then I went to Bonn uh, where the Secretariat was based. And again, one of the early things Christiana said to me was that my job was to make the Paris Agreement more likely and more ambitious, but I couldn't tell anyone I was doing it. So maybe I'll leave off the story there and hand over to you, Christiana. So to pick up on that, um, the negotiations of, uh, of, of any agreement and the Paris Agreement is the last agreement that we have, but it builds on the agreement of the convention itself. It, it builds on the agreement of Kyoto Protocol in 1997, et cetera. So it's not the first climate change agreement. It's just the more far reaching one um, that we have. But um, that whole negotiation has always been the purview and uh, the, uh, the responsibility of national governments who are the parties to the convention, and that will always be the case. But it was very evident that um, given the negative consequences and the impacts that everyone was already experiencing of climate change, and especially the projections that we had of how much more impact we would have if we did not begin a descent of greenhouse emissions, it was very evident that the responsibility could not be only of governments and that if there was shared responsibility and if there was a bigger tent and a more collective effort to address climate change, then governments could actually be more ambitious if they felt that they were being supported by private sector, if they felt they were being supported by subnational governments, if they felt they were being supported by civil society, by scientists, by grandmothers, by doctors, by nurses. Um, and so although the Paris Agreement was negotiated formally and adopted uh, by national governments, it would probably or very likely not be as ambitious as it is and certainly not as long standing as it is, um, had it not been for an active participation of everyone else surrounding the national governments. And that is one of the main differences between Copenhagen and Paris this very, very clear intentional mobilization um, that we used to call the surround sound um, effect because what we wanted to build there was um, such a surround sound that national governments, no matter what direction they looked, they could see other stakeholders moving in the direction that the national governments had to move. Of course, there was also a drop in prices and technology was moving forward. There was uh, an Obama administration in the second term with much more political flexibility and being able to reach out to China and at least four bilateral agreements between the United States and China before the uh, multilateral agreement in Paris and, and, and many other factors that help. But the fact is that we were able to layer all of these factors one on top of each other and have them be mutually beneficial in order to go from the collapse of the negotiations in 2009 in Copenhagen to the amazing um, breakthrough and historic achievement that, um, that Paris was. That was, I mean, Paris, we look back on it and you know, we, we went through the last six years, a lot changed. Um, but in Paris in 2015, you know, the core of it, as I mean, you, you, led these, you led these negotiations, but the core of it were national governments, right? Making these, these nationally determined contributions to cut their emissions um, by certain amounts, by certain dates. Um, and if you, look, if you look to the future, just to bring us to the, the moment as we dig into your book, over the last six years, you know, what, what's, been, what's given you optimism over the last six years since Paris? And then maybe what have some of your biggest concerns been over the last six years? I mean, if we look back over what's happened since, since that really historic moment in Paris in 2015. Well, let, let me start with concerns because I want to end on the optimistic side uh, and, and um, 
Tom will have many other, the, the list is long actually on, on both of your issues. Um, but my main concern is no longer, are we moving in the right direction? We're definitely decarbonizing the global economy and you see huge progress in generation uh, on base on renewables last year we beat the record and uh, global installation of renewables was 50 percent higher than it had been the year before despite the fact that we were all in a COVID and there was very little demand for electricity etc you see you know progress in electrification of vehicles i'm here today in costa rica for the launch of teslas uh, in costa rica and there's hardly uh, any car uh, self-respecting car manufacturing company that is not already moving over towards electrified models. So you see, and finance sector is just moving incredibly. So the direction is set. I'm no longer concerned about the direction. We are concerned about scale and speed because the fact is that even since Paris, in the past one or two years, science has come out with new uh, reports on how the negative effects of climate change are actually accelerating and how we are about to cross very, very, very dangerous tipping points. So the direction is set for the global economy. Can we actually pick up speed and scale and be at one half the global emissions by 2030, which is what science demands. And that's why we call it the decisive decade. Are we optimistic? We're optimistic, A, because there's a lot of, uh, of evidence, a couple of uh, examples that I've just shared that we are moving in the, in the right direction. But also, Brady, because we have a sense that in particular in this post-COVID phase, there is so much more of a mainstreamed consciousness and awareness about the fact that we, are really in a very, very perilous situation and that we can do something about it. Those two come together, right? It's not the sitting back in the doom and gloom, here we are, you know, condemned to a terrible future. It is, oh my God, yes, we're in a very perilous uh, situation, but we can actually do something about it. And that is the core of uh, what we fundamentally uh, ascribe ourselves, believe in, and work by, which is stubborn optimism that I'll let Tom define. And Tom, as you do, I mean, you open up the book talking about tipping points and this need that Christiana just mentioned to have global emissions by 2030 as maybe one of those first, one of those first tipping points to avoid. Um, so maybe, maybe give kind of a similar reflection on, you know, what's given you optimism, what's given you grief, and you actually talk about grief in the book, but what's given you optimism, what's given you grief over the last six years? Yeah, no, and, and just to, to add on what Christiana said and sort of build, no, I won't repeat what she said, but I think one thing that has caused me both concern as well as optimism, um, from the optimistic side, I think we have begun to realize um, that people and that societies need to be at the heart of this transformation in a way that we didn't back in 2015, right? There had been a tendency to break issues down and say, you either deal with climate or you deal with social justice or you deal with something else and you have issues that you focus on and they're slightly disparate and they don't really fit together. And, and worst of all, there was kind of even competition between people in terms of which issue, issue was most important. I think much of that has softened to a degree, and I think there's now a realization that unless we address all of this together, the interconnected nature of it, then we'll never succeed in doing any of it, right? And I think that in particular where that comes around is climate and the idea that, that people can't lose out in this transformation. There will be fundamental changes that have to happen to the economy. That doesn't mean that they have to be bad, but it does mean that it's gonna be different. And there will inevitably be some individual winners and losers in that transformation. And that, you know, to a degree that has to be accepted, but there needs to be a policy response, there needs to be a corporate response and economic response that meets the scale of that challenge. And I don't think yet, I think it's really good and positive that we've started to think about that in a systematic, a systemic way from policy and corporate strategy. But I don't think we've really cracked it. You know, there's a bit of kind of dusting off of the idea of something like universal basic income from the 1960s, but we don't really seem to have the kind of intellectual muscle behind what does our economy, our society look like as we transition it from the way it is now to the cleaner economy of the future that of course is undergoing multiple other changes, including automation and what's happening with the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So I think within that, 
One thing I'm concerned about is that the speed that we need to decarbonize at will be faster than we're able to keep up with those other economic transformations. And that in itself will lead to democratic systems snapping back and these flips to extremism that we've seen periodically over the last six years. I think that's the thing we really need to keep around. If we get people moving at speed and scale with us, understanding this is in their own best interests, then we can absolutely move this really quickly and we'll see transformations unfold extremely fast. If we think that this is really important, then some people will be left by the wayside. I think we're really gonna have a tough time. So in your book, maybe Tom, just to follow up with you on that, in your book, as you and encourage you all to, to get it at Elliott Bay, Elliott Bay Bookstore, um, but in, in your book, you talk, you have these 10 action steps, right? Of, of what, what needs to be done to address the climate crisis. And the seventh one you talk about is a bit of what you were just saying, which is about how do we remake the global economy so it, it has this, this clean transformation. And one of the things that I was struck in reading, in reading the book over the last couple of days was a little bit of a tension between how much you need to re, remake kind of the capitalist system and the norms of the capitalist system. And you know, there are moments when you, when you kind of congratulate a lot of these corporate commitments that are being made on net zero, which there's a lot of positive stuff happening there. And you know, there are different underlying factors driving a lot of these different industries. Um, but I, I thought maybe you could talk a bit, Tom, about you know, do you, do you think that there's a fundamental remaking of some of these norms, or do you think it's, you think it's kind of the, the system as it is will will help to decarbonize at the scale that we need? Yeah, so so it's a it's a great question, but and the way I would answer that is to, is is two things. First of all, I think one thing that draws Christiana and I together is we're both pragmatists, right? We both say, where's the needle, and how can I move it? What change can I make right now? Um, today and I want to see an impact as quickly as possible right that leads you to a certain way of thinking and a certain way that you address some of these different challenges I think we also both agree that momentum is the key to breakthroughs rather than intellectual perfection right it's possible to say I'm going to sort this out then I'm going to go and implement it in the world or you can say I'm going to make a start I'm going to do what I can and then I'm going to evolve and go further and further once I've got momentum going so in in the lens of those two things I think that there's a continuum that incorporates the two elements that you've talked about rather than a dichotomy, right? It is true that today we exist with a capitalistic system that has lots of problems with it. That capitalistic system needs to be reformed, but even before it's reformed, it can do a lot to allocate capital towards solutions, to redirect money, to technological innovation, to deploying solutions, to figuring out how workers are looked after in a better way. Um, and that's all good. Probably, I would suggest that ultimately we're gonna have to move more in the direction of countries like Costa Rica to value quality of life, to look at well-being along with GDP, to start unpicking some of these metrics that have begun to guide much of the decision-making in our lives to really go further and begin to put values back into our lives and to the core of our lives to start thinking more about, you know, beyond GDP. But I do think that, that both of those things, if you start from where we are and get the momentum where you can with the system that we have, which is urgent work, then along the way, you can start thinking about how do you tweak it to create a more perfect system. Can I just jump in there, um, Brady, because, um... I think also, you know, the transformation that Tom is, is talking about, um, it is so time sensitive. If we had 50, 100 years to say, okay, you know, it, it's okay. We can address climate change over the next 100 years. Well, then, you know, I would probably say, okay, great. Then over the next 100 years, let's rethink the economic system and the economic principles. And let's reinvent ourselves and look for something else that is different. Let's make an assessment of capitalism, which is not in every country, but in most countries, uh, the reigning economic uh, logic. And let's do strengths and weaknesses. Let's see how we can reinvent. They take the strengths and, you know, improve the weaknesses, whatever, and come up with a completely different system. Yes, in principle, that would be ideal. We don't have the time for that. We just don't have the time. We have to decarbonize the global economy with basically the economic logic that we have right now, at least until 2030. 
then we can perhaps, you know, make space for more innovation and more creativity and more disruption. But the physical limit, the budget that we have up there, it's not a monetary budget, it's a greenhouse gas budget. And we are this, this far from going over that budget. So we have to respect that budget first. Now, the fact is, that we have seen over the past few years and yeah, very recently. So unfortunately still in isolated fashion and not in mainstream, but we have seen the beginnings of a very important shift from just to use, you know, two, two, two terms from, um, from shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy. And that shift has actually made a huge difference it's made a huge difference because we begin to understand or the enlightened CEOs that are certainly out there, sadly still lighthouse, uh, having a lighthouse effect because there, it's not all CEOs, but those enlightened CEOs understand that profit is necessary for their companies and obviously as a pillar of capitalism, but that it has to go hand in hand with purpose profit and purpose, planet and people, all of those, those four Ps have to be there at the same level. And if we understand that, if in fact capitalism is capable to reinvent itself in that direction, then actually, and perhaps, you know, using climate change as the whip, the, you know, like, come on, get on with it quickly because we don't have any more time to waste. In that, in that sense, the pressure, the time pressure of climate is a good thing because it is forcing that transformation at a speed that is probably unlikely to have occurred did, had we not had this, um, this pressure of climate change. So from, from that perspective, I think actually we have a huge opportunity to understand like we do, you know, in, in any, uh, in any, good way that an emergency is a, or any crisis is an opportunity in, uh, in unfolding. Um, so let's use that. Let's use that and let's go quickly as far as we can this decade to push capitalism toward profit, purpose, people, planet being valued the same. It's not going to be a perfect system by 2030, but hopefully we will have been able to put roots down that are deep enough to then be able to build that out further uh, as we get to halving emissions by 2030. I think that, that the idea that you're bringing up is quite optimistic. And I think in a good way, it cuts to the kind of core of, of some of the book and you lay out, I thought you laid out a really compelling framework to sometimes you say you're optimistic and it can come off as Pollyannish, but I think you really, fleshed out a really thoughtful framework around optimism. And I'm just gonna read a passage that you wrote, which is that optimism is about being able to intentionally identify and prescribe the desired future so as to actively pull it closer. And I, I read that as, as sort of you're saying that if you can imagine what a better future can be, the story that we tell ourselves, that it's a lot more likely that, that we can get there. And I, I, I just thought maybe if the two of you could just talk a bit about your framework for climate optimism. Um, and then there's some wonderful questions from the audience coming in. So I'll go to those next. Tom, um, you want to take it first? Sure, I'll jump in. So so you're right. And I, and I think that um, the, the quote that you've got there really kicks it off. But we see optimism really as the best strategy that we have for creating change. And that comes from you know, our life experience in lots of ways, but it also comes from the experience of creating the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, I mean, I saw when I came in the web and the knot of pessimism and it's impossible and what about this and we can't do it because, and that's a system that is far more complex than many that we face in so much of our lives. And, you know, I was privileged to witness, you know, Christiana's catalytic role in that as well as many others. And in a way, it was the sense that we could do this, this sense of collective possibility and this bubbling determination that created the outcome. The optimism wasn't the result of success, it was the cause of it. And actually we've seen this many times throughout history. 
that people have held a sense of a stubborn and gritty and determined optimism kind of as a candle in the darkness. It's it, Optimism has been most relevant in these really dark moments. I mean, if you think back of like, fight them on the beaches, I have a dream, Gandhi salt marches to the beach. We alienize these moments subsequently, thinking of them as moments of great transformation and courage. And of course they were, but they were actually quite dark to live through. But certain individuals said, I refuse to submit to this idea that it is impossible for us to make the change that we need to make. And that example encouraged others to think that change was possible too. So digging in with that determination, you can see it in your own life. If you decide that a tough challenge is gonna be possible, you're gonna show up with courage, you're gonna give it everything you've got, you're determined to make a change, that quickly becomes infectious. And one of the things about climate change is there's a lot of hand wringing, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and that's all absolutely right. I mean, we are facing now the most decisive decade in history. And we'll know in the next 10 years whether we've turned this corner and gotten on top of this or whether we've begun to genuinely lose control of the climatic system and all of the terrible impacts that that will lead to for us and future generations. But far from making us cow in fear, that fact should make us ride out to meet it. That is an enormous privilege to be here right now. No one else is coming along to do this for us. If this is gonna be done, it's gonna be because we figured out how to do it. Now, yes, that's scary, but there's no reason why we need to shy from that. We need to face that with as much courage as we can muster, as much stubborn and determined optimism. And here's the thing. We actually don't have another option. You right. tell me, what <laughs> other option do we have, right? I mean, our other option is sit, you know, in a dark, uh, in, a, in a dark box of fear and despair and helplessness and just, you know, watch everything collapse. Uh, is that what we really want? There's just, I mean, anyone who is an adult or a young adult at this point, or in fact, even young people um, who have any sense of responsibility know that we don't have another option. It's not like we can sit here and go, well, let me see, is it vanilla or is it chocolate ice cream? For No, it's, you know, are we going, actually going to destroy the possibility that we humans have right now to live on a thriving planet? You have to understand, Brady, that, you know, when, when Tom says we are privileged, we are, from an evolution perspective, we are so privileged because the human race has never had the sweet spot of natural conditions that we've had over the 12, past 12,000 years. We've never had that in the entire history, 4.5 billion years of this planet. That's why we have propagated so quickly. That's why we have now humans in every single continent because this planet gave us 12,000 years of a stable, fantastic natural conditions that allowed us to reproduce ourselves, to create what we know today as modern civilization, to create you know, the economic, social systems, et cetera, et cetera, that we have. Now, here's the choice. Do we build on that and continue to evolve as a human race onto higher levels? Or do we actually cause so much natural destruction that we will not be able to control it anymore because it will take over. That's the choice. So it's not, and it's, you know, it's, it's not like we have too many options. It's either we stand up tall, strong, and brave, determined to create the kind of future that we want and that we want to give to our descendants or we sit back and we accept that the destruction that we have wrought over the past few decades is just going to continue to the point where we will hit natural tipping points that will make this planet go completely out of control and threaten the human species in many areas. It will make many areas of this planet unlivable, uninhabitable. Imagine, Imagine immigration, forced immigration out of survival reasons. The kind of immigration that we've seen over 
the past 10 years, multiply that times 10, times 100. How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with that? Do you know what the political situation will be, what the security will be, the kinds of walls that will be built? That those will be walls that will be built. The kind of you know, military power that would have to be developed in order to keep our, our, our countries for the few countries that would still be inhabitable. I mean, this is just crazy. We cannot allow ourselves to go down that route. And here's the thing, right now we have a choice. That's why Tom says we are privileged to have that. A, because we have lived those 12,000 years in a sweet spot, but also privileged because right now over the next nine years, we have a choice. If we get to 2030 and we have not halved our emissions, Brady, people who are much younger than I will no longer have a choice. That's the tragedy because it'll be too late because we will have started a cascading system of tipping points that we have no control over. So this is it. This is it. These are the nine years. That's why we call it the decisive decade. So wake up, my friends, because this is your moment. I, I, when you read the book, I, the first two chapters, Christian and Tom do this fabulous job in the first two chapters, setting up both almost kind of like an Amy Poehler style, the good place, the bad place situation where you have kind of illustrated. And I thought, you know, I've seen this done before, but I thought it was so well done. You know, everything from the geopolitical impacts, the climactic impacts, the dietary impact from micronutrients in our food to, through to the through the, you know, variable harvests that are causing hunger, so to air quality. And I thought you did a really great job in also illustrating the reality that humanity could also be happier and healthier on the other side of carbon. And I think that's also a very powerful point. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna take this, and it's kind of this choose your own adventure, <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to call the arms because- Door it's... one or door two. <laughs> right. And, I, and, I, and the, the, the kind of urgency is voiced there. So I'm going to turn to a couple questions that are coming in from, from the audience. And the first is about um, kind of fairness and equity and it's in, it, in multilateral negotiations. And the question is, should, should countries that contribute, and I'm sure you, you managed, you dealt with this deeply, but how, how do you see this question of, you know, countries that contribute the most to climate change, should they be held most accountable or is that just not possible politically or how do you, how are you seeing that? No, that, that, that they are held more accountable for sure. Uh, it is, I would say, the golden rule, the golden principle of the climate convention going way back to 1992 and still operating today uh, and probably still operating for decades to come because it is absolutely clear that the cause of climate change uh, is those uh, countries that have most benefited from the industrial revolution progress and from the burning of fossil fuel, which resulted in a lot of comfort and well-being um, in industrialized countries, but that left developing countries behind. And so that is why the political groupings that negotiate the climate change are for sure respect those lines. There is the group of industrialized countries that are subdivided, and then there is a big, huge block that is called the G77 plus China, which is actually 130 countries, not 77 anymore, um, uh, 130 developing countries that understand that they have certainly in the past very little responsibility. It is called historical responsibility, an obvious term. Um, but it's not, you know, as clean as uh, and, and black and white as that, because the fact is that there are some emerging countries among the developing countries that are coming up. And if if they follow this same industrialization and development path that the north, the global north has followed by the burning of fossil fuels, they will also contribute in the future, in the near future to the cause of climate change. And uh, whatever goes up in the air now will stay up there for a hundred years. So, um, so historical responsibility is definitely a tenet of the of the um, of the convention and of the Paris Agreement. But there's not a period behind that. There is a comma, 
a comma that says, yes, we will respect historical responsibility, conceptual comma. Yes, we respect historical responsibility, comma, and we acknowledge future responsibility, future shared responsibility. And that is where there is an invitation for everyone to contribute in a differentiated manner. Because let's remember, it is only those point sources, those countries or those companies that have emissions, substantial emissions, that can actually substantially reduce those emissions. Countries that have no emissions or very little emissions, and I'm sitting in one in Costa Rica, but there are many developing countries that have 0.001% of global emissions. There's very little that we can reduce. So we have to look at where the emissions are and see where those emission reductions come from. That does not mean that little economies such as mine are completely exempt. Every country has a responsibility to contribute to the solution. And if we don't, we will be left behind by the technologies of the 21st century. Those countries that don't want to get on the new clean, healthier bandwagon will be left behind in obsolete technologies that are actually very, very polluting um, and become increasingly stranded assets and a threat to economic stability. So it's in everybody's interest to move forward, no matter how big or how small the economy. That's well put. And I'm going to actually go to Tom with another question, because this is actually a question we get a lot at Chris, and I think it's a really interesting one, which is, how, what do you, what do you, and you talk a little bit about consumerism and consumption in this book. Um, what, what do you think the average person, you can define average in different ways, but this is how it's asked, what do you think the average person um, should be expected to give up uh, or to sacrifice, as, as it's framed here, in order to address the crisis? An, an individual so so it's a, it's a great question. And I think that we need to have a new way of thinking about that in all honesty, because I think that that tends to be the mindset, right? It's, we are doing something bad and we need to sacrifice ourselves in order to do something. And we need to stop being, you know, misbehaving as it were. And inevitably people resist that, right? Because that creates a dichotomy where we think that this is kind of a nice thing that we want to give up. Um, Living in the kind of future Christiana just described isn't nice for anybody. So we should just say that first and foremost. It isn't nice practically, it isn't nice morally, it won't be a pleasant thing to experience. So what we say in the book is that it's worth, and this is counterintuitive given the emergency that we're in, but it's worth thinking about this in a slightly broader timescale. We tend to overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in 10 years. And as Christiana said, we need to reduce our emissions by at least 50% by the end of this decade. Actually, for people who are watching this, probably from North America, that's enough time to do that with proper planning and thought and investment. And guess what? It'll make your life better by doing it as well, because you'll feel that you are participating in a great shared endeavor and you won't feel so afraid and so dis detached from this thing that we're doing together. So think about it in a 10 year time frame. That is enough time, probably most of the capital intensive items in your life, your boiler, your furnace, your car, other things will probably be replaced anyway in that time period. And with some thought and some planning, you can make different choices, whether it's solar, whether it's an EV, there might be a premium to pay, but if you spend some time thinking about it, there will be a financing package that spreads those payments over a longer period of time. So it probably won't be insurmountable and there'll be savings as a result of that as well. It's time for you to think about as life goes on, you know, what do you want your diet to be? What kind of food do you want to eat? How do you want to remain healthy as you travel through life and get older and maybe change your diet, eat less meat, cut it out completely. However you want to be, you're on that journey. It's even time, and we've found this as well, as we mentioned earlier, Christiana and I run a podcast called Outrage and Optimism. One of the reasons we do that is so that we don't have to travel around the world talking to people in order to have an outlet and a message. And that also has the benefit of meaning that we don't have to fly. Of course, not been a problem for the course of the last year. We can do it remotely on Zoom from wherever we are. 10 years is even enough time to really think about what kind of career do I wanna have? What do I want my role in the world to be? How do I want to evolve that in a different way so that I can contribute or structure it so that my emissions can be less? So thinking about it in that way is actually 
flips it around a bit and starts turning it into something that is more of a challenge. It gives you a bit more time. It means that you can achieve more if you think about it in that time frame. And rather than just doing something that feels ineffective in the face of a great problem, like changing a few light bulbs and doing a few things that feel ineffective, you're really engaging with the issue. Now, we've talked about consumerism. In the book, we also say you need to not only focus on consumerism and your own impact, you also need to think about how you engage with power. And that's different for all of us, right? But all of us are employees. We might run businesses. We might be students at school. We might be parents. We might be on a school board. Just think about your life. Where do you touch power? You're a voter. You might have investments or 401k. How can you raise your voice in each of those roles to try to encourage those that you interface with to also do what they need to do? Because while it's true that we can't do this without consumer action, it's also true that consumer action on its own isn't enough. There are structural barriers. So we both need to focus on what we can do with the right mindset, but also how we engage with power. To add anything to that, Christiana? Yeah, I think one, one easy way to think about um, on your, in your personal life, because um, as, as Tom says, you have to make change, you all have to make changes in a personal life in addition to uh, reaching up to, to the systemic. But you know, one easy way to th think about it in your personal life is to think about carbon emissions as inefficiency. Mm. Carbon emissions are the proxy of inefficiency. If, if you are, you know, putting out carbon emissions through your old boiler, as Tom has mentioned, or because your home is not um, properly insulated and you're actually cooling, you know, everybody else's front yard or park, um, or, um, I don't know, if you, you know, if, if you decide in the summer that you want your home to be so cold that you have to run and find four sweaters, um, the, the fact is we are so inefficient about the use of energy, so inefficient and so irresponsible. And, and we have to be much, much more conscious about where am I using energy, whether that is electricity, whether that is power in my car, whether that is, you know, anywhere else, where am I using it? And how can I improve the quality and reduce the quantity of energy? And if we look at our habits, our daily habits through that, where am I using energy? What is the quality of that energy? And how can I reduce that energy? The fact is that we become much more efficient operators in our economic system and, um, and definitely more healthy because if that means, you know, that we change our diet, as Tom says, or we get more exercise as opposed to, you know, getting in the SUV for running down two blocks and getting something at the, at the store, we'll walk the two blocks. You'll make you much healthier. Um, the fact is that we have to stop thinking about the fact that uh, we have we, that we have to pay a huge penalty here. How about we think, how can I be healthier? How can I bring down my electric bill? How can I be a much more much more conscious uh, citizen of this world that it's actually going to make me happier? So it's not about this huge burden. It's about an opportunity to improve the quality of our lives while we're improving the quality of the planetary life, health. I'm gonna go back to a question about multilateralism and, and negotiations that came from the audience too, and then we'll, we'll work. I had a closing question that we can, we can wrap up with some thoughts, but you know, how, how fragile, I mean, especially in the context of what was happening in the United States under the Trump administration, and how fragile do you see these multinational agreements? And if one country opts out or won't sign, um, to what extent do you worry that, that one or two bad actors, especially big ones, render, render it not useful? Okay, here's my question. It's a very important question, but here's my question to the person who asked that question. How many countries follow the, the example of the United States? A big fat zero, a big fat zero, right? I mean, the United States exited, okay, withdrew. We, we all knew that it was temporary uh, because it doesn't make any sense. And so we knew, you know, that the United States eventually would come back and dovetail back in. How many countries withdrew? 
uh, one, one is the, you know, tally of the list of countries that withdrew. So at, at least, as I, and that's not true for all multilateral agreements, I, I must say, but on the Paris Agreement where there was a full agreement, full unanimous agreement of 195 countries, definitely under the, the government that was in power at that time. So yes, you know, you could have other countries whose government changes and then, you know, maybe temporarily they withdraw, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, Brady, every country knows that this is in their self-benefit. What country wants to destroy the planet or destroy its own economy or threaten the life and livelihood of its own citizens? It just doesn't make any sense. This is as complex as it is, it is a shared common good. And most countries understand that. Now, it's going to be wobbly, right? Because we're transitioning from the irresponsibility of the 20th century to the responsibility of the 21st century. And every transition is messy and wobbly and will go through peaks and valleys, fine. Um, but the direction will remain because it is the only direction that we can actually push for. I agree. <laughs> um, that that um, just to maybe go to a, a, a closing question here to have you reflect for a moment. But you know, in the the latter half of your book, it's really dedicated to almost this ten step this ten step action guide, uh, if you will, to what needs to be done to save the planet, and. You know, as you as you think about that, is there anything you know, maybe kind of a, a, a teaser for folks to go and <laughs> also get the book? But is there anything there that you would that you would speak to is especially important when you think about this this ten step this ten step guide that you that you spend you know you devote the second half of the book to outlining? You've spoken to um, a lot today. Sure. So the book. You know, we, we thought a lot about who the book was for, right, when we wrote it, because, of course, as you said, so many different actors need to come together and make this transformation it needs to be an everyone everywhere initiative. But at the end of the day, everyone is an individual. Everyone has different access to different levels of power, have different access to different levers that they can pull on. What we think the book will provide is a holistic assessment, whoever you are whether you have huge influence or none at all, there is always something that can be done. And as we set out at the beginning of this conversation, this is it. This is the most consequential decade in human history. And all of us are going to want to have played as much of a role as we can have played, win or lose at the end of this. And we still feel we have every possibility that we can win. Right now, genuine success is still possible. Genuine failure is possible, but right now, genuine success is still possible. And whether or not we make that transformation is down to each and every one of us, the decisions we make as leaders, as well as as individuals. What this book will do is it will meet you where you are, take you through a series of actions that can help you understand the world and your role in it, what's possible, help you understand both what to do, why it's important, how you can make progress from today through to that regenerative future. So I would just give that overview. I mean, we see the whole thing is hanging together. We also talk in the book about the attitude and we've talked about that today, stubborn optimism, both the attitude of how you show up, the individual actions around your own footprint and your engagement with power. That collectively, and what you'll do with the book is find a way to take all of those steps and make your life better at the same time. It has been, it's been a real honor having both of you here, Cristiana joining us from Costa Rica, um, Tom joining us from the UK. Um, I also learned in reading about your backgrounds that um, uh, someone in your family, Cristiana's father was actually president of Costa Rica. I learned when the decision was made in the 1940s to um, disband the military. And I, I, a lot of the discussion in the book we didn't have a chance to touch on um, was about uh, happiness and thinking about alternative ways of, of measuring well-being which I think is another really powerful area of discussion and some of the ways that I think about that, that sacrifice question that was brought up from the audience, that there are other ways to think about well-being, And hopefully over time we get to some of those. Um, and, and Costa Rica is a very, very good example of a country that is, <laughs> has really kind of been at the vanguard of thinking about well-being. 
Um, so I'm, I really have enjoyed this discussion. I really want to thank Town Hall and then just wanted to offer the floor to Christian and Tom if you had any closing words before we hand it back to our hosts. Well, thanks, Brady. It's, it's been a, a, a fun conversation. Um, thanks very much for your thoughtful questions, yours and from the audience, very thoughtful questions. I, I guess I, I would just close by saying, don't, don't feel overpowered, don't feel overwhelmed, you know, by, by something that is admittedly as large as climate change. We've never dealt with anything as large. But here is the beauty about climate change, that it is as large as any, any of us can imagine and more, because we cannot imagine the threats that we have in front of us if we don't do our job. But it is at the same time, deeply personal. That's the amazing thing. It is not just a big, huge thing out there and in the future. It is deeply personal and it is very much of a here and now issue for all of us. So I would encourage everyone to see it through that lens without denying the complexity, without denying you know, where, where we're going in this century to, um, to go in through the portal of how do I make this personal to me, to my family? And what is it that I can do to contribute here and now? And that actually opens up a whole space inside of us of feeling so much more powerful agents because we're engaging with something as big as the future of humanity. And, and I would just add, so 13 months ago, we were launching this, the hardback version of this book at an event a real human event pre-pandemic uh, at the New York Times Public Library. And things looked pretty, pretty, pretty bleak on climate, right? I mean, there was President Trump, re-election was uncertain. There was a lot of anger on the streets. Emissions were rising rampant. You know, we had a few months to run till the Glasgow negotiations. It wasn't clear what was gonna happen. Look at what's happened in the last 12 months. I mean, it's astonishing. And people have talked about this an enormous amount in the course of this pandemic that first of all we were terrified was going to make us take our eyes off the ball on climate and lose an enormous amount of time we've now pivoted back far more than we ever were before and climate is now front and center of policy making of corporate strategy of employee engagement all over the world this has now become the moment this has now become the year that we hoped last year was going to be and it's better even than we thought it could have been in 2020 so if you, to pick up where Christiana left off, if you feel overwhelmed by this and a sense of it's not possible, look at what's changed in the last 12 months. Change can happen far more quickly than we ever take account for. We're living through it right now. And this is actually going to be a fascinating 10 years to live through. Thank you for your time. And thanks for zooming in and joining us all in the Emerald City of Seattle. So with that, I hand it back to our friends at Town Hall and thank you for convening these important civic conversations in our community. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, um, on behalf thank of Town you, Hall, Brady. thank you all so much for um, presenting this afternoon with us. Um, I really appreciated the framing um, of how, how you're talking about this issue and how it can be um, a really positive thing. I think a lot of times we do get stuck in the doom and gloom. So thank you so much for bringing that to us. Um, I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you for your questions. Please purchase a copy of The Future We Choose from Elliott Bay using the link in the chat. Um, and I hope that you all stay safe and uh, have a great have a great day.